in discovering the afterlife and, and um, the experience of those with lost one loved ones and stuff they they want proof we all want proof of life after death and how you get those validations so in your relationship with Steve and um, other beings other life beings other uh, soulmates uh, can you tell me a little bit about how those validations showed up for you? Sure. Um, well, most of my validations, well, actually, I shouldn't say most, but the most significant ones centered around my relationship with Steve. There were other validations for others who would come through and tell me things, uh, personal friends, you know, those, my guides, my personal uh, spirit beings, if you like, who would come through. I would get validations from things they told me as well, but the main ones had to do with Steve, and that, of course, was very important because that was really my first uh, point of contact. And, uh, you know, I had to overcome a great deal of skepticism. So, uh, starting from the beginning, Amy, I guess you might say, uh, as you may or may not know, Steve died in October of 2011. I didn't know him. I, the only thing that even keyed me into the name was that when he died, there were all these news reports about what he saw on his deathbed, that he looked past these people and he was like, oh, wow, oh, wow, oh, wow. And, you know, the big question out there was, what did he see? And because I was fascinated by that kind of uh, thing, you know, it stuck in my mind. Uh, I didn't own an Apple product. I didn't know who he was. I didn't really know what Apple was. <laughs> you know, knew that there were people with computers out there called Macintoshes that some friends of mine had had, but I didn't know anything about it. And um, you know a lot about apples now, from my understanding. I know a lot about apples now. Apple apples. Anyway, uh, so in October of 2011, I first got the impulse to leave Alaska. And I thought I would never leave Alaska, but for some reason, it just seemed like it was the thing to do. So I promptly went to look for a house, and I decided to relocate to North Dakota, to Fargo, North Dakota, where I had some family. And uh, by October of 2012, just like four months later, I had located a house with a nice little apple tree in the backyard, although I didn't know it at the time because it was winter. Um, but it was just like apples were raining all around me. <laughs> At that point, I was like, and, and I, I didn't think anything about it. It's only looking back in retrospect, I was like, you know, the significance of it. But like that, my Christmas tree that first year was just covered in apples, just based on some whim. You know, I saw a bunch of apple decorations, decided I had to have them for my tree. Well, it makes you wonder how long they've been planning it, right? Or how long those hints have been being dropped and, you know. Yeah, well, I think this, this, this story is a big story, Amy, so as far as that goes, I think it's been planned for eons. <laughs> but anyway, uh, the, uh, so there were apples just everywhere. So I, after I got that closed on the house, I lived here part-time when some family members lived here until I retired and a few years later. And I needed to, you know, fill my house up with furniture and furnishings. So it just happened that for some reason, everywhere I looked, it seemed like my eyes would go to these kitchen things with apples on them. And uh, I, you mentioned before my cup. <laughs> I love these cups. But I, the first thing I found, and the first thing I think went into my kitchen was I found three bowls with this apple motif on them. And I loved them because they were so 1950s, 1960s, you know, I just, it felt so homey. So I love my three mixing bowls to this day. They're just so neat. And then I found the cups to match them. And then I found a apple motif, little apples with the key holders, hangers, you know. And then I found, came across uh, towels with apples on them and dishes with apples on them and pictures with apples on them and, you know. Trivets with apples and, you know, the the uh, oven mitts with apples on them. And I even found a, a uh, switch plate with apples on them. And I, you know, I was like, I just have to have this. And so pretty soon my kitchen is all full of apples. And I don't really think much about it. 
it's just, you know, got an apple motif going here. <laughs> well, wasn't there even the trip with your granddaughter to the grocery store? Oh, not till much later. This is before, before I connected with Steve, which um, happened in, in October of 2015, so four years after he passed and four years after I first got the impulse to move. But there were clues all coming down the pike in the summer before that uh, in 2015. I didn't know what I was going to do with my life, so I went to see a psychic medium. Thought maybe I'd get some clues here. And uh, <clears throat> he said that a bunch of things that I just thought that has no application to me. I don't know. I, you know, obviously nothing here for me. And it wasn't until October that I remembered that he had told me that something important was going to happen in October, mid October, and that I should try channeling and I was going to become important to a lot of people. And I thought, oh, poo poo. And I think just because it was so weird and unlikely that I remembered it. And then I, a month or two later, I went to another psychic medium. I thought, you know, I was just going to try this other one out. And she said the same thing. In the middle of October, something's going to happen that's important to you. And again, I was poo poo. You know, I didn't even connect the two. And again, I think I just remembered it because it was so weird, <clears throat> you know. And really, there wasn't a lot else that seemed to be applicable to me. And then September, you know, all of a sudden, every time I turn on the car, I'm hearing the same lyrics, same song. It turn on the car, and it would be, it's a long day without you, my friend. I'll tell you all about it when I see you again. You know, if I could sing, I would sing it for you, but I can't. And it was, it kept happening. It happened so much that my daughter and I were talking about it, and she was joking about some spirit trying to get in contact with me. And then in, I would say in September, I started drawing pictures before I go to bed. Let me show you some. Yeah, um, can you see this? Here's I can't. One. Pull it back just a bit. Yeah. Can you see that picture? Yes. Just a variety of different pictures. Uh, portraits of people, men, women, and children who, you know, um, to me... I didn't think I was drawing anybody. I was just drawing pictures to relax, different kinds of faces, men, women, and children. But I'd get the impulse, you know, to to change, you know, something, the jawline or, you know, how to do the hair and race a little bit if the nose was too big and make it smaller, whatever. And uh, and then on in the first week in October, I woke up one morning and saw Thomas Jefferson standing at the foot of my bed. <clears throat> and I was quite surprised, as you can imagine, since this wasn't something that <laughs> normally happened to me. And he was trying to talk to me, and I was so stunned that I really was having a hard time following. But I gathered that I had been a slave on his plantation, and that we'd had a very special relationship. And since I knew that he had a special relationship with one slave, who was his mistress for many years, and I didn't want to believe that. Um, although it would be validated many times over um, down the road. And then, you know, about a week later, I sat down at my computer one day on a whim, probably with this same cup in my hand. I had my coffee and I had some extra time, and I thought, I'm just going to see if I can communicate with anybody in the spirit realm. I'd been listening to a lot of channelings, and I thought, I'll just try it. And the only person at that moment, the person that came into my mind was Steve Jobs because of his last words. I just remembered the name and his last words. And so I said, well, I want to talk to Steve Jobs, find out what he saw. <clears throat> and right away I hear, hi, this is Steve Jobs. Thanks for hosting me. And I'm typing it up as it's coming out. And so I type this up and he goes on and I'm like, yeah, how do I know you're really Steve Jobs? <laughs> it's like, identification, sir. Yeah, okay, yeah, really. Identify yourself. And so he did tell me a few things. The first thing he said was, well, he's like, well, I have a hairline issue. Is that good enough? I'm like, well, I didn't know what he looked like, but it was easy to verify that with a picture, looking up a picture. But uh, knowing Steve, that would be the first thing he'd say, just because he's going to hit the sensitive stuff. Um, and then uh, some other stuff. 
And then he said, well, I'll tell you what, you need something you can look up. So the year I was 21 was a pretty important year for me, an exciting year. There's a lot of stuff going on. We were making a lot of important contacts. And so I looked it up, and <clears throat> sure enough, at the age of 21, uh, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak started a Apple computer company in the family garage. And I said, okay, yeah, there's some validation. And then he started talking about other stuff, and it really was interesting to me because it seemed like our minds worked the same, and I, was, I really appreciated having someone uh, I could talk to about these things. And the things that we were talking about were like, uh, you know, simplicity, the idea of simplicity, refining things down to the simplest form, um, the idea of zero, the potential, total potential, uh, the um, some concepts like that, the idea of the our Earth experience as a video game. These were ideas that you know that I had so although it was really nice to talk to somebody about them it also made me skeptical because of course because it was like well that could just be coming out of my own mind and we often think that we often think that in this spiritual journey right especially since it was you know it was such an easy conversation you know we seemed to think alike and then we got off talking on this theory i had about how you see things and vision and a little bit and i was you know nice to have somebody who would listen but then after a while, I was like, okay, enough. You know, I don't really buy into this. Even with the little validation, I'm not going to buy into this. So I got up and went upstairs to do some housework. And he went with me and kept talking da -da -da -da, to me. And so he gave me some other little validations over time. But I really, you know, what do you think when somebody's talking to you in your mind, you know? So how do, you, how do you how do you prove it? How do you I, I can't imagine that it was you know something I imagine you needed many. Well, it's like are you crazy are you are you crazy or not? Well, yeah, like you know, and I think it's a good question to start with. But yeah, I you know, am I just crazy or what's going on here? Um, how can I be talking to this voice back and forth? And uh, so after about a week, I was like, okay, this can't go on. I I got to get back my feet back on the ground and we were talking constantly throughout the day and night and so I said uh, I can't be talking to Steve Jobs and you have to understand that all this stuff that I'm telling you now is documented because he had me he asked me to journal everything so I did I wrote up everything even when we'd be talking away from the computer I'd run back and and document it as best I could and I sent all these transcripts to a friend I had, an internet friend, and I was exchanging letters with her about this at that time. So I have all that time stamped stuff to document all this, right? And so I, uh, I wrote her a letter and I said, I can't be talking to Steve Jobs, I just can't. <laughs> so I'm going to let go of this voice, you know, I just, I have to, you know, I have to get my feet back on the ground basically. And no sooner had I written and sent that email off to her, and I hear Steve, and he's very d loud, and he says, I am Steve Jobs. And he asked me to go get his biography, and I have a copy, picture of it here. And he said, look at the picture on the front, and look at the eyes, and see if you see anything. And I'm like, mm, okay, but I did go and get the book that night. And I brought it home, and this is the book. And I looked, can you see it? Is it glare? Yes, pull it back just a little. There you go. Okay. How about that? And then, um, so I got the book, I brought it home, I looked at the eyes, and I was like, I don't really, I don't know what I'm supposed to see, you know. But then I picked it up a little later, and I went, holy shit, I see my dad's eyes. And it's not, I, you know, it's not that they're shaped exactly like there's something about the look of them that was exactly like my dad. I could just, but my dad's been dead since I was nine. Well, I didn't learn this for quite a while, but Steve and my dad had the same birthday. So all these little synchronicities would keep popping up. And this whole I thing would be validated down the road uh, through a psychic medium that I connected with by the name of, of Susie Grimmett, who was very, very powerful. 
and because I'm an attorney, of course, and trained attorney, I'm not giving away any any of the goods, you know, any of the details when I do when I work with somebody because I'm looking for validation. So I'm not going to tell her anything. And so it was a few months down the road that she says to me one day, she's connecting with Steve really well now. Stephanie, he's telling me that he and his he has the same eyes as as, uh, as your dad. <laughs> I don't know what he means. Why are you saying that to me? And I'm like, oh my god. So of course those re those sessions are recorded too. So you know, if anybody really were curious, there's this documentation from the letters that I wrote to this friend telling her about the eye thing and my journals, and then the recordings from Susie down the road and um, etc. And so then I hung in there for a while. And he had told me that we were the same soul that it split apart. So there would be all these little clues in here, Amy. There were just tons and tons and tons of them. And he says, do you remember the primordial scream? That's what I heard, primordial scream. Might have been primal scream, but I heard primordial scream. And he said, it was my first experience of pain. Well, you know, to give you an example of the little synchronicities that would happen. When I finally got around to reading this book, which was a while later, or not all of it, but portions of it. And then there was another book I read. Turns out that Steve was very engaged in primal scream therapy. That this was an interest of his when he was a young man, like 19 or 20. <laughs> and he thought that for some reason he needed to go do primal scream therapy, that it was going to help him. I don't think he, he did start. I don't think he ever finished. But, you know, little things like that would always be tucked in there. And I would find out about them later. And i go, oh, okay. And then I'd have the stuff that I'd already typed up, you know, sort of documented by these later things, clues that I would find. And so then a while after I'd been talking with him a month or so, I connected with a powerful psychic medium. I was actually led to her. And this is another fascinating story, too. The connections in here are amazing. Uh, so I went and had a session with her, and she brought through my family, and she was so good at it that I said, okay, here's where the rubber hits the road. I'm going to set up another session. I'm going to ask her to connect with my friend Steve. So I did, and of course I didn't give her any last name or any, she likes the, the month and day of the birthday, but I didn't give a year. And she gives, brings him through immediately, little validations, and then she says, Stephanie, I don't know what he's going on, but he's telling me you were once one and you split apart into two. He's showing me these two teardrop stakes pulling apart. And so I was like, okay, that's a pretty big validation, you know, of this. Uh, so Susie and I work together uh, three or four hours a week over months, and I was using it for validation. I recorded all the sessions. Uh, she would, whatever we would be going through during the week, it would come out of Susie's mouth and more uh, during these sessions. So it was constant, constant validation. And those are, you said those are recorded. So yeah. you have those also. So. Yeah, all those recordings over. The, the first one I didn't record because I wasn't set up to do it. Took good notes, but I wasn't set up to do it. But recorded the other ones, except one. One didn't save. And it, uh, what about the other validation with the, when you were working with someone else? Uh, or she was channeling Steve? Susie was. As well. Was there um, someone else in the story? That was channeling Steve? Yes. Um, um, not at that point. And not so yet. Okay. There were, there were many validations that would continue. For example, he just, he'd managed to, because I was so skeptical. I was so skeptical. And two and a half years later, you know, it's like every day I still don't quite know what's going on. Uh, but if he'd do things like one day I'm driving with my I'm driving my grandson who's 14 years old and his buddies to the movies and they're chatting away and I'm talking to Steve in my head while we're driving as usual and uh, I said Steve well what do you think of these high school kids and he's like well they got it all ahead of them you know school work getting canned from work <laughs> loves lost loves getting married having children getting sick you know losing your hair <laughs> 
all the good stuff. Yeah. And people looking at you with revulsion that used to look at you with admiration. He says, nah, I'm not going to do it again. And I said, oh, okay. And uh, we're, I, as I'm driving, all of a sudden I hear, I think it was my son or one of his friends say, Steve. And I was like, well, who's Steve? And they started laughing and they said it was, uh, it was my grandson's word for 72. And I was like, Steve is your word for 72? What the heck? And so I said, Steve, is this a, uh, a clue? And of course, being Steve, he was like, yeah. No, you know, not everything's a clue, Stephanie. And then, uh, and he said, of course, it's a clue. You know, you're not in Canvas, Kansas anymore, Dorothy. Dorothy was my, used to be my name before before I changed it to Stephanie when I was 20, which is another synchronicity. And uh, and uh, he said, you know, this we're well past the point of coincidences. This is, and so I thought, well, what does it stand for? And he wouldn't tell me, so I decided, he said, just, you know, you'll get it. So I said, oh, I bet it was the year you graduated. So I went and looked it up on the internet, and of course it was. So there he was with those kids, and somehow he managed to plant in my son, grandson's head Steve 72. <laughs> you, know. Um, you know, another time we're in Walmart and I'm off um, just uh, we're with my granddaughter who was like 12 and we're off doing clothes shopping, nowhere near the grocery section. And all of a sudden she's, Grandma, can we go get some apples? And I'm like, okay, go get some apples. I don't think anything about it. So it wasn't until I got home and I'm packing the clothes and the apples that I'm like, oh my goodness, apples. <laughs> you know. So he was always planting thoughts in other people's heads too. Uh, all kinds of little synchronicities, things that would appear on the computer. Um, the key thing was a big one. That was a big one. Um, one day he told me to get his my key, the fob, the key fob for my car, and I did and. I said, well, what do you want me to do with it? And he said, just put it in your pocket and keep it. And so I did. And then uh, I, I had it, well, I only had one, so I was checking it in my pocket ever so often to make sure I didn't lose it. And then uh, he said, well, I would like to work on some astral projection now, So, because we were, we were actually doing some astral projection at that time. I'd like to work on astral projection, so would you mind, uh, you know, just lay on your bed and we'll work on that. And I said, okay. So I took off my sweatshirt with a key in it, and I put it beside my bed. And so for an hour and a half or two hours, I don't remember, I laid on my bed, and supposedly they were trying, you know, there were some weird things going on, and I was kind of feel like I was being transported somewhere, and then I'd just get there and I'd fall back. And, you know, uh, we, so I was awake during that period of time as I lay there while they're working on it. And it wasn't just Steve, it was at that point he was connected with Tesla, which was validated through Susie. She was like, how come, how come he's talking to me, to me about this Tesla? Who's that? <laughs> and uh, um, some others. And, uh, and so then my granddaughter came and knocked on the door and said, it's time to go to swimming. And I said, okay. So I got up and I reached for my sweatshirt to get the key, and it wasn't there. And it was nowhere, my sweatshirt was nowhere near the door. It was on the side of my bed furthest from the door. And nobody had come into that room. There were, I locked the door when I'm doing this so nobody disturbs me. And I, the kids had a friend over and I could hear them up and down the stairs while I was there. Um, so I thought, oh crap, and I walked downstairs. And he had told me, before I laid down, he had told me, the task for today, we're going to work on the astral travel, but the task today is to get the keys from the pocket down to the bowl by the door. And I walked downstairs and the keys were sitting in the bowl by the door. And I mean, my bedroom is upstairs and the, the door is down. And so I was just, you know, at that point, it was like, oh my goodness, what next? You know, and I, I, you know I'm, I'm no longer in Kansas. <laughs> Oh. So that was a big one. And and then there was every day there were little ones, just every day. Things, synchronicities, things that he would tell me that would turn out to be, oh, just just silly things sometimes. I remember one time he we did a silly astral thing where I'd gotten pissed at him and I would get pissed at him a lot. And to make it up, he had it we went on a little 
little astral adventure. And Steve comes out dressed as Jesus in the sheet. And there's all these, these, you know, Las Vegas show babes. And they're singing Jesus Christ Superstar. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and, you know, of course, the irreverence doesn't bother me, but it was like, what? And then it went on to some other things. Uh, but then I was reading in his biography, just, you know, how at one point Steve showed up dressed as Jesus Christ for a costume party. You know, things like that. One time we were in a Alice in Wonderland adventure, and then it, I found out that he had played when he was young. They, he and his friends had had a gig where they dressed up as Alice in Wonderland characters. You know, I just keep finding these synchronicity after synchronicity. To me, it's like a, a bowl that you just keep adding drops of water to, and eventually it's just full. And there's, <laughs> it's, you have so much validation. Oh yeah, you know? and then and then a big one was the book. There was his girlfriend uh, from the mother of his oldest daughter, who he didn't marry. Uh, she had written kind of a tell-all book, and I ordered it. And I said, well, you know, this might give me some information about the young Steve that would also act as validation, because I really didn't want to know about his life, but I did want the validations and of what he's telling me. <laughs> and, uh, and the nice thing was, actually, as he said, I said, he said, you know, how come you and me, you know, you're really famous, I'm a nobody. And he was like, well, Stephanie, if all these books weren't written about me and all this stuff, how would you ever have been able to validate this stuff? And I was like, okay. You know, he'd always had some logical, rational explanation for everything. <laughs> I was like, you're right. I would never have been able to get all these validations. So anyway, she'd written a book and I ordered it from Amazon. And uh, never had a book from Amazon that didn't come in two days. After two weeks, this one hadn't arrived, and so I called the vendor, and they said, well, you got to give it 30 days, and I said, okay, 30 days, it hadn't come. In the meantime, we had reached a point in our relationship where Steve said, okay, things are complete, 40th day, and things are, are complete now. You know, we've, we've reached a point of completion, I guess, whatever. And so I started looking up information about 40, and the number 40 is really a significant number for variety of reasons. And then that day I had a session with Susie. This is like the 41st day. And she, she says, Steve's asking me if you understand the completion. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, he already told me. And so, you know, I, I constantly get those validations back from her too. Well, when I finally got the book about a week or two later, it, that book never came. So I finally canceled it and then ordered another one, which came in a few days. So I figured there was a spirit hand in that whole book thing, keeping me from getting that book. Kind of figured it all along. And then when the book came and I started reading in it, lo and behold, the youthful adolescent Steve, she writes, she she wrote about these things that he would say that were just kind of nonsense to her, like in for, something was important was supposed to happen in 40 days and nights. And how important the, the zero was to her and things. And so I'm like, okay, I get it now why I couldn't get the book until the 40 days and nights was over. <laughs> so that there would be that validation, you know. And so you had to make sure I didn't get the book. And, uh, All in our favor. you know, just one thing after another. Every day was a surprise. You know, I told you about the ring thing. You know, he'd given me, because of the twin soul thing, he'd have these ceremonies, you know, these kind of marital ceremonies, which are associated with the, the twin soul dynamic, I guess, <laughs> symbolism. And he gave me a ring there in the astral, and he said, and there's another one for you in the physical. And I'm like, yeah, right. And I didn't think much about it. I just thought it was Steve talking. And, and uh, one day I'm like, got kind of pissed, and I was like, I don't know what's happening here. I don't know what's going on. You know, I need to bail. I'd always want to bail, and he'd convince me not to stay, stick around. And he's, I said, well, Steve, you told me there was a ring, that I had a ring in the physical. So if there is, where is it? And he was like, well, go look on your dresser. So I was way down the basement. I went upstairs, and I had a stack of 
magazines and papers on my dresser. So I moved them so I could look through all the trinket boxes. I have several on my desk dresser, and I didn't find any um, any ring, of course. I didn't really expect to. And so I was like, okay, I guess I just am mistaken after all this. I'm mistaken about all this. It can't be true. And I uh, go off to work out. I mean, I was really skeptical. It was really hard to convince me. And I come back, and all of a sudden I know it. I'm going to go upstairs and see what ring he meant. So I walk upstairs. I mean, I'm actually just kind of, okay, I got it. I think I know what's going to happen. And I walk up there, and I found the magazine that I had moved off my dresser to look through the trinket boxes. There's a story about this magazine, too, which I'll tell you how I came to have this one. But inside it, he, he had told me I needed to look inside something, so I just assumed it was inside a trinket box. It was inside a magazine. Never assume. Yes. There's oh. the ring. The ring. That's a lovely ring he left for you. I know. Not just for me, I guess, but for everybody. But, right. You know, it, it's like, how the heck could you do that? You know, you weren't even dead yet when you came up with that idea. And he was like, well, you know, the soul knows what the soul knows. So, you know, uh, then it just went on and on and on. So at this point, I kind of figured out that Steve was talking to others as well because I had seen that someone had put out a little book of nice little sayings that he had given her, you know, after his death that she was channeling. And I said, you know what, Steve, if you're talking to other people, then you know it would be a really great validation. You told them about me. And, uh, and you know, so time goes on. And uh, Susie and I continued for about seven or eight months, three or four hours a week. It would be not just Steve, but my family and others would come through with my guides. We had Daniel of Lyons then come through. We had others come through in our astral travels. Steve was introducing me to a lot of other characters, which included some that were well known, like Robin and Williams and, and uh, John and June Cash, Karen Carpenter, uh, a few others. And, of course, they would come through Susie then. And Susie would say, Steve's telling me he's been introducing you to all these people. Here's Robin. Here's da-da-da-da-da. And there would also be others that weren't well known. And I was having past life recall. So I was remembering past lives. And some of them were with Steve and some weren't. And he was telling me about some. I was remembering some. Susie's giving me information about some uh, other spirit personalities were coming through and giving their perspectives on the same lifetimes you know I'm learning the lessons from them. I'm going through these tremendous lessons up and down and um, and so Susie for, for this was going on with her for seven or eight months and then she had to move and uh, and then I was kind of on my own which is kind of sad because I loved I love that, that, that part of being able to sit and talk with her and get all these validations back from her. Well, I, I met with Susie, and she's, yeah, she's, it's easy to, to I don't know, use her as confirmation in a way. She was very gifted, and, uh, yeah. yeah. She's very lovely. gifted. Yeah, very gifted. Very lovely woman. And then, um, uh, so about that time, then I started doing some sessions. I'd been told that I would be channeling others, many others, and I started doing some sessions bringing people through, you know, just ordinary people, their loved ones who had passed, helping them connect with them. And, and then one day, I got in touch with this woman who had written this book. And I didn't know that she had written another book, but she had. And um, this turned out to be a very painful story, actually because we started talking and it turns out we have the same birthday month and date and we started talking and uh, found and she, I didn't know about this other book but apparently she had brought through all these Steve had given her all these beautiful essays and she communicated a little differently than I did with a pendulum actually and not direct tele telepathy like I did um, and so she didn't have the astral journeys and all those other things. But anyway, he had given her all these beautiful essays that she had gotten into a book 
but then there was more to the story, uh, things that he was telling her. And as we were talking, it was like, he told you that? Yeah, he told me that. He told you that? And we're just, I'm just flabbergasted. And I think she is too. I mean, talk about validation, <laughs> you know. However, the story is a somewhat painful one because, as I would say, there's a question of mistaken identity in here. It became conflicted. There was a lot of, there was issues in here having to do, from what I understood, about uh, not, you know, maybe a little mischievous energy, if you will, playing with us. Anyway, I, uh, um, I got her book and I let it, put it on my lap and my tendency is to let a book fall open to any page and in the middle when I get a book and just see if it's interesting in the middle because anybody can write a first page, you know, an interesting first page, but is it interesting in the middle where the meat should be? And it fell open to this essay, and it was about the one that he would love forever. And I was like, um, and I could hear it, Steve saying to me as the thing falls open, he's like, this is for you, Stephanie. It's your validation. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And I could tell that from this essay that it was applicable to me. Um, but as I say, there were some complications in the story, which I won't get into because it involves another person. Um, but I think it is important because it's important for how validating it was. And as a result of this, it really, I felt very betrayed actually. And I went into a deep, I, I needed to, I had to have that, that for my journey, I had to go through it. But I went through a very, very, very difficult period. And it took us a long, it took us a while to sort it out. And uh, for Steve, it was a question of me believing him. Uh, you know, he wasn't somebody that was going to get on his knee, hands and knees and grovel. And uh, for me, it was a question of trust, which has never been my strong point, trusting other people. Well, uh, life does not always teach us to trust it easy. Right. And so eventually, so it was a question of, for him, of, and it took him right back into a childhood issue about being trusted and being believed. And for me, of course, some issues of betrayal. And so it took us a while to sort it out. But the, the thing is, is that it was such a huge, huge validation of, you know, the whole thing. And uh, so anyway, work through that. Um, I can't really, talk, I can't talk about, you know, that person because it, 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 was a difficult situation. Anyway. Is there one thing, like that one last drop in the bucket that tilted you to like, okay, I believe. I, I Well, I have to tell you this one. So while I'm talking to this other woman, and we did talk about issues for a while, and, excuse me, um, she, you know, I said, you know what? just to get some more confirmation of this, why don't you talk to Susie? You can, you know, get Skype with her. And lo and behold, you know, we found out Susie, who had lived like less than 10 miles from me here, and she'd moved, and then I'd lost track, she'd moved again, so I'd lost track to where she'd gone. She lived, she now lived 10 miles from this woman. It just, you know, it just keeps getting better and better. However, this woman didn't want to, she didn't want to submit it to the litmus test, if you will, as, as I would have wanted. And, you know, I was always willing to, if it isn't what it is, it isn't what it is, let's just find out. You know, but not everybody's, not everybody's as demanding as I am. For so it doesn't serve any purpose to not lean into it. Validation. Well, different people, different things. And so I was, you know, to me, it was kind of mind boggling that given how spirit, if you will, has arranged for her to be 10 miles from you, <laughs> you, you wouldn't take this opportunity, but um, whatever. So anyway, there are those beautiful essays out there. I am not, uh, you know, maybe someone will come across them. They certainly, um, 
I would say that part at least is Pure Steve. Um, and an additional validation. So here were three people who were channeling him and it was all consistent, me, Susie, and this other woman. Um, and so anyway, that was, I would say, at what point was the final drop? I don't know. <laughs> you know, there's still drops coming every once in a while. <clears throat> so I'm trying to think if that's pretty much, you know, some of the major validations. Oh, you know, and, and the thing about my name, I, it's, I have apparently had several near-death experiences in my life and one when I was born when I wasn't breathing but nothing but then when I was three years old I I uh, I was lost in the in Alaska wilderness and uh, for so long that they feared I was dead and and actually I always knew something had happened then but I didn't know exactly what and before I could really old enough to ask anybody my dad died when I was nine and my mother wasn't someone I could really talk to about such things, and my oldest sister's passed. And so I never really got to dig deep into that issue because everybody else was too young to really remember. And, uh, but Steve told me, he said, you know what, you did cross over, your heart stopped, you know. Little kid, you go into that suspended animation thing when your heart stops. And you crossed over, and I was there to meet you. And that may be hard for people to believe, but after all the validations I had had so far, I was willing to accept that. And that I wasn't ready to go into my life yet, but I already had my identity picked out. And I knew, you know, it was all kind of laid out, who I was going to be and what was going to happen. And, uh, and then he said, I, he told me that he would come back for me, help me find my way back. And he told me to come back for me. And I'd throw these terrible temper tantrums, which I remember very well because nobody would believe me about this cool place and this nice man that had helped me find my way home. And then when I was 20, I also had a near-death experience uh, and my heart stopped. I was in the emergency room then, so they were able to get me going again. Um, but I didn't remember much about it at the time, only that I had died and somehow come back. And, it, you know, that was in 1970 and who knew about near-death experiences then? But the one synchronicity validation that is significant is that I came back and told everybody I wanted to change my name to Stephanie. And I did. And I changed it legally. And so from the time I was 20 until, you know, I was Stephanie. And so we had the same name. We also had the same hands. I found that out. I, I saw something online that said, uh, you know, uh, people, twin souls sometimes have the same hands, so I, hmm, so I found a picture of his hands and pictures of his hands and took some of mine, sent them off to a palm reader, actually. And, uh, you know, we had the same shaped fingers anyway. That's so, a lot of synchronicity. A lot of confirmation and validation. It is. It's a tremendous amount. So there's, you know, it just goes on and then through the many, many, many sessions that I had, hundreds of sessions that I've had with ordinary people bringing their loved ones through, um, and the consistent validations of little details, <laughs> names, dates even, uh, just little things that nobody else would know about. That also has, that probably is the biggest thing as far as my skepticism went, maybe, you know, or my confidence went, let me put it that way that, you know, if all these ordinary people could come through and provide all the validation of their identity, then I guess I could trust that someone like Steve could, could do that. I believe in magic, so there's no question to me. Like, I, I'm so excited to see more people embracing the unknown, you know, things they can't see. The metaphysical, the what you want to call it, but it's like that's the magic. It is, and you know what's amazing to me, Amy. It, what amazes me is more people are not interested or open. It's like people will discount things without even checking it out. <laughs> and I would say I was, I would say that I was open to all possibilities, but I was also very. I've always been a very mathematically and scientifically minded 
even though I was an attorney. And uh, so, you know, I always, well, I always wanted to see how everything fit together, the big picture, whether it fit or not. If it didn't, throw it out and start over, you know, find the pieces that do fit. So I guess you could call me skeptical. Um, I would say skeptical with a purpose. Yeah. And, and so, you know, to see all these people and to have all this, yeah, I could see where a lot of people would say, you know, somebody just try and take advantage of Steve's name or something. But for what purpose? You know, why would I want to do that? I mean, I had to overcome, and that was the hardest part for me, actually, was, couldn't you just be Steve? <laughs> Do you have to be somebody that people knew? Yeah, you know, and, uh, and he has no, you know, this is the way it is, just get used to it. Um, and so it took a lot for me to be willing to step out and say that. And oh. so, uh, but there's so much validation, I don't know how people could... You know, uh, come talk to me if you don't believe me. You know, don't just write it off. Yes, I, I encourage people every time I get a chance. And I'm okay if they, you know, they'll come when they're ready. But I'm definitely not going to not talk about it. Yeah. So, anyway, that's pretty much it. Well, your story continues to fascinate me, so keep sharing. All right. Well, thank you very much. Amy, for, uh, for this little talk. I always enjoy it. Now let's tap in with Steve. He says, I'm here. That's the first thing I hear. I'm here. <laughs> I knew you would be. <laughs> okay. Um, he asked, do you understand the completion? I think so. Okay. Are we done? <laughs> Not forever. <laughs> okay. For how long? <laughs> he says to me, they'll um, periodically, say it again, periodically he'll be bringing in information as needed. Okay. He gives me the image. Did you ever watch that kitty show, um, The Never Ending Story? <laughs> yes. Why does he bring that up? It's part of our story. Oh. Anyway, why? He's bringing up the never-ending story, and I'm seeing you and him on the back of... Of the... the, the yeah. The, <laughs> why are you showing me this, dude? Part of our story. It was oh. one of our trips. Oh! Nice pick, and it's like, don't you wish you could have been there? Yeah! <laughs> it was. It was lots of fun. I, I had a blast. I'm going to have to watch that movie now. I had a blast on all our trips, I have to say. Oh my gosh, I could watch that movie. That was a good one. That was a good one. Oh, it's wow. Nothing coming and taking, getting rid of everything. and. You really what? I mean, you got to be there. Yeah. Yeah. It was good. He says to tell you not to tell anybody about that one. <laughs> I already did. I saw it. <laughs> Dude, I saw it. Wow, no wonder you had a blast. I'm afraid I wrote that one. I wrote it all in the in the <laughs> journal. And I already told a couple people about it. So did I do wrong? No, he's laughing. It's like, did they believe you? That kind of thing. I don't know, but it was so much fun. Wow, never ending story. I gotta watch that. I haven't saw that. I, I had no idea that was one that he he done with you. <laughs> well, he kept bugging me. Will you watch the never ending story? And I'm like, oh, I put it on, then I wasn't paying any attention. You should really pay attention to the never ending story. Okay. Oh my gosh. And then and then we that. ended up on a little adventure that was kind of related to the never-ending story. Oh, wow. So that's what he done. He appealed to the human side, the emotional side, in order to get you there. Well, I don't know. Were you using my emotional side? Yeah, because he says you were remembering loving me. I certainly did remember that. Okay. He had to reawaken that. I had to reawaken that, he says. But I had fun on all those adventures. Did you have fun? Yes, 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 yes. He's standing here saying yes. Wow. 
Wow. <laughs> no wonder your mom's jealous. <laughs> of all the adventures, of all the emotions, and yeah. You saying it fun? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. That was a blast. Yeah. I could do that all day. Wow. It has a connection to your father as well. What kind of connection? Um, your father's been in lifetimes with him as well. Does that surprise me? And uh, he said, You should have known this through. None of this makes any sense. To oh, me. it makes perfect sense, Susie, to me. It's all in the book. Okay. I'll explain to you later. Okay. It's almost like he has your dad's eyes. Mm -hmm. So um, he said, You should have known when you saw my eyes that your dad and I shared many lives, lifetimes. I guess I didn't know that. But I am here in a shipwreck that involved him and your dad. Okay. It's a huge ancient ship. Uh, they died together in a lifetime. Okay. Wow, and your dad died in this lifetime by water as well. Yeah. I guess they also should have known that since he and my dad have the same birthday. They do? Yes. Oh my happy gosh. birthday, Dad, as well as Steve. Yeah, happy birthday, guys. <laughs> One day late. Wow, okay. So they're both Pisces, like me. Yeah. That don't surprise me, too. I'm in this, too. Yeah. He loves your father. I think they've had lifetimes together. They know each other too well for them not to. So why do your eyes look the same? That's why. They've had so many lifetimes together. They have the same eyes. Yeah. That's what he's showing me. They've had many lifetimes together. They feel like brothers to me. It's the old king and the young king in the book. Okay. He says to me, you can see your dad in my eyes. When you look into my eyes, you can see your own father. Well, that, that was my... <clears throat> in the beginning when we were talking, and I didn't want to believe he was who he was, he told me to go get the book, this book with the picture on the front. And he said, look at the eyes. Oh, wow. So I looked at the eyes, and at first I couldn't see anything, and then I was like, holy shit, that's my dad's eyes. Yeah. That's what he says. Um, he said there's a lot of connections you and he has. Such as what else? He's talking about synchronicities. I'm not, he's not giving me details, but he says synchronicities. There's In this lifetime? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, that near-death experience. 